Greetings in the precious name of the soon coming King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, I'm going to start to teach the book of Revelation. I really do not know how long this series is going to take. Now, I started teaching the book of Revelation in my church in Sinhala and Tamil languages just yesterday. And that happened uh, to be the 13th of September, year 2015. Now, the first uh, message that I delivered yesterday was very anointed, very powerful. And people came and said it was so touchy. And they said, why not you do this in English also? Now, let me tell you something, my dear friends. I have been teaching the book of Revelation in many countries of the world, including America, the United Kingdom, Germany, since uh, 1998. And uh, many people uh, told me that uh, it was a very good eye-opener and the Lord has really blessed us through your studies. So why don't you write some books on Revelation? So I started, I started to write uh, uh, the book the commentary on uh, the book of uh, Revelation and uh, some of you may have come across my books and this is called uh, the glory of Christ revealed the first chapter of the book of Revelation and then the second book is called the busy brilliant beastly and blurred churches talking about the churches in Revelation chapter 2 this is book 2 of my Revelation series and uh, book 3 of my series talk about the churches in uh, Revelation chapter 3 the boring benevolent and badly behaved churches and uh, many people have read these over the years and and have told me that uh, they were a tremendous blessing and uh, I'm really honored uh, when several Bible scholars called me and said, Suresh, we were able to learn uh, a lot through these books and uh, we were able to prepare messages and teachings uh, from these books. And some people use these books as uh, references. Now, after writing up to the third chapter of Revelation, I more or less abandoned uh, the idea of writing further because now the trend is uh, not that much reading. Of course, still people love reading. Many people appreciate reading. But now the trend has become uh, media. Media in the sense, uh, visual media through videos, through video teachings, televisions, people learn. And uh, I have uh, a very enhanced media ministry aimed at Sinhala and Tamil speaking people and uh, many, many thousands of people, Sri Lankans and others who live uh, in many countries watch my programs and they say they are blessed. And therefore, I produce more video teachings than books. I have written about 11 books so far and uh, I'm not uh, that much interested in writing more because the video ministry has grown and is growing and uh, is blessing uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Now, English speaking people also approached me asking me to do a teaching on the book of Revelation. So I thought, uh, okay, now that, now that I have started teaching the book of Revelation in my church, why don't I coincide that with the English teaching of the same through video. Now, my dear friends, I taught the book of Revelation in English way back in 1996, from 1996 to about, say, year 2000, in uh, Kandy, Sri Lanka, where some very God-fearing, good uh, people, very uh, educated people came and uh, they sat and studied and they said, it's a great blessing, etc., etc. And also, I had done this teaching in my church in Tamil and Singhala. Uh, I don't remember when, but it was way before year 2004. And uh, the teaching spanned uh, over a period of two years and uh, people were blessed. Now, I'm relaunching this teaching on the book of Revelation 
for reasons best known to me and many others, uh, one of which uh, is because many people have envisaged uh, uh, teaching the book of Revelation and have embarked on the venture not really knowing what they are talking about. Now I am not saying that I am the most qualified eschatologist here. I am the most uh, uh, best teacher to teach the book of Revelation. There are, there are others who I really uh, honor, who have done a great job in trying to elucidate the book of Revelation. But <clears throat> I praise and thank God for the way in which he prepared me to be able to teach the book of Revelation. He taught me the Greek language. Then he taught me the Hebrew language. Then he taught me the Aramaic language and the ancient Akkadian language. So I have studied those four ancient languages. Way back in 1998, I got the opportunity of translating the book of Revelation from Greek into spoken Aramaic of the first century. Because when Jesus and John dialogued, they spoke in Aramaic, but John wrote uh, the book in Greek. Now why did John write the book in Greek when Jesus spoke to him and he responded in Aramaic? Because we know that the rest of the New Testament books, the 26 books of the uh, New Testament were written in Greek. So in order to maintain the consistency, John who writes the last book of the New Testament, thereby writing the last book of the Bible, writes it in Greek. So it is only too fair to have uh, the 27 books of the New Testament from Matthew all the way to Revelation in Greek. There's another reason. Those days, virtually everybody knew Greek, even though they had their own dialects, even though they knew uh, many other languages, the written language was Greek. Although Rome was the empire, Romans were ruling the then known world, more than their Latin, Greek was used. So, it was only too fair for John to have written it in Greek, for more recipients to be able to be blessed by the book. Now, we know that in the book of Revelation, the expression of Jesus to call himself, I am Alpha and Omega, uh, verse 8 of chapter 1. I am uh, Alpha and Omega, he says, the beginning and the ending. The reason why he is using Alpha and Omega is uh, an abstract command to John to write the book in Greek. Now why, why do I say that? You know the expression beginning and the end has been there among the Jews for a long time. And in their Jewish alphabet the first letter is Aleph and the last letter is Tau. So the Jewish rabbis, when teaching about the beginning and the end of Jesus or whatever, even, even on peri peripheral grounds, when they talk about something from the start to finish, they use the expression from Aleph to Tau. Jesus, when speaking in Aramaic to John, should have used Aleph to Tau. But he changes it to Alpha and Omega, the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabet. There are 24 letters in Greek. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, Zeta, Eta, Theta, Eta, Kappa, Lambda. Now those 24 letters start with Alpha and finish with uh, Omega. The Hebrew has 22 letters. Aleph, Beth, Gimel, Dalet, He, Wau, Zayn, all the way down to Tau. So Aleph from Aleph to Tau versus Alpha to Omega. So Jesus was abstractly indicating John to write the material in Greek. Okay. So what I did was, in 1998, when I got the opportunity to translate the New Testament from Greek, not the New Testament, the book of Revelation from Greek into the first century spoken Aramaic, I was able to see a lot of truth embedded within the book of Revelation. 
it, a lot of things made sense. Obviously, wouldn't it? You know, if you translate something from one language to another, when you, if you have the ability, to, ability to revert back to the original tongue, you you would really understand what that really meant. Okay. So, my dear friends, God equipped me with uh, languages. Moreover, I was blessed by studying uh, the book of Revelation under some good teachers in uh, several colleges that I studied. I studied at the Assemblies of God Bible College in Sri Lanka from 1986 to 89 and I had uh, a couple of wonderful uh, teachers who taught me eschatology and uh, the book of Revelation. Then I studied at the Elim Bible College in England, which then became the Regents Theological College. And uh, there also I studied eschatology and the book of Revelation. Then I studied uh, in the University of Manchester where I pursued uh, a, a written degree uh, by, by, by doing a research on eschatology. Then I studied in America in a couple of universities where I also was exposed to several uh, teachings of several eschatologists. And um, God really equipped me. And uh, doing all these researches on top of the language, uh, languages that God had given me, I was able to very prayerfully and very carefully prepare uh, an a teaching from the book of Revelation. So my dear friends, I would invite you to join me in trying to understand what the book of Revelation is talking about. Now, as you see, I'm not having any notes or anything. I'm just talking from out of my head. Now, that is not to brag about my photostatic or the photographic memory. No, no, no. That is to say, I really thank God for how he has written these things in my system. These things have so appealed to me. They have meant so much to me. They have come deep into my veins, nerves, atoms and cells. So I have this in me. So what I have gotten into my system, I am putting out, I am sharing it with you so that you also could be blessed the same way I am blessed through the book of Revelation. Now my dear friends, having said what I said, please be careful. If I say anything contrary to the word, don't receive it. Whatever I say, however attractive and appealing it might be, must be substantiated from the Bible. If the Bible doesn't substantiate what I say, no matter how attractive and appealing it may be, throw it in the garbage. And that, that not only applies to me, my dear friends, it applies to anybody. Even those who operate under tremendous sheer anointing of the Lord. There may be those who try to elucidate the book of Revelation. And of course this applies to the entire scripture from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't matter if they operate under tremendous anointing. It doesn't matter if they perform miracles, signs and wonders. It doesn't even matter if they raise people from the dead. I believe in those things. But I don't believe when such people who have those real true anointing come out with stuff that cannot be substantiated scripturally. The Bible is the norm. The Bible is the premise. The Bible is the foundation. The Bible is the premise on which one should stand in trying to establish any kind of doctrine, any kind of teaching, be it to the personal life, the family life, or the church life, or the life on the whole. So my dear friends, be careful when you study, and I try, I'll try my level best to, to keep everything within the perimeters of the scripture, which is the inspired word of God. Okay? So I would uh, humbly request you from you to come and join and uh, together peruse through the book of Revelation, going to somewhat in depth in trying to understand what this beautiful apocalypse is talking about. Okay? Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Now I'm using the King James Version. The revelation of Jesus Christ 
which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. God chose John to write the book of Revelation. The Greek word for Revelation, apocalypsis. Apocalypsis means to unveil something, to, to, to show forth something which is hidden by a veil. What God did was, he chose John to unveil things pertaining to the future. John looked through visions at the future. Now Revelation 22 talks about the new heavens and the new earth and, and, and with that the book comes to its conclusion. What God did was God took John in a vision to be able to see the future all the way up to the new heavens and the new earth not beyond that yes of course there is the eternal future even beyond the new heavens and the new earth okay but John's vision stopped at the new heavens and the new earth so from the time of John John was looking at the future through a vision all the way to the commencement of the new heavens and the new earth. Okay? Now this reminds me of somebody else. Another guy who saw something similar but on the other side. Namely Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, right? The Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. When he wrote Genesis, he didn't know anything that had transpired in the book of Genesis. Now Moses was in the Median Desert when God took Moses through a vision to the past. Right now, how that vision came, whether the vision came in the form of the visions that we know, like a movie or what, I don't know. Nonetheless, God somehow showed things pertaining to the past on that side. Now, we know that the eternal past is also eternal, right? Now, we know that God has been always there. He never originated. He never commenced. He never started. He has been always there. But he started something. The Bible says in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, Moses was taken, in a vision perhaps, to the point where he creates the heavens and the earth. So, Moses was looking on this side, to the eternal past, in a vision, all the way up to where God created the heavens and the earth. And he starts from there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, so if you look at me, if I'm Moses, okay, imagine me to be Moses. I'm looking that side to the past, okay? So my left hand goes, stretches towards the past. And I'm seeing up to where God created the first heavens and the first earth. And from there, I'm receiving the word and I'm giving to the people. Moses looks at the past, all the way up to where the heavens and the, the earth were created in Genesis 1.1. And then he gives us the Bible, okay? He gives us the Bible. He sees up to a point. There are things even beyond that, but God concealed them. God didn't reveal them, okay? And he gives us the Bible. In the same way, now I'm stretching my left hand towards the past and with my right hand I'm giving the Bible, okay? That's Moses. Now, I'm using my left hand to hold the Bible and I'm stretching my right hand towards the opposite direction which is the future and now I'm John. 
That was Moses. This is John. Looking at the future all the way up to where the new heaven and the new earth are going to be created. And then I'm giving the word. Amazing, isn't it? How God has given us the word. You know, the word has no beginning and no ending. Of course, the word is Jesus. We know that. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. But the expressed word of God to us has been limited to be between Genesis 1 and Revelation 22. There, Moses looks at the past and gives us the word starting from the creation of the first heaven and the first earth. And here, John is looking at the future and he is giving us the word up to the point where God is creating the second heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. Amazing, isn't it? So I really thank and praise God for the expressed word of God, which is enough for us, which is enough for us. God knows this is all I would give to my people. That there is much more, much more, but the word of God for humankind is limited to the 66 books of the Bible, starting from Genesis to Revelation, Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. So, John is chosen. Now, who is this John? One of Jesus' disciples. Now, he uh, was the one who was uh, reclining on the side of Jesus during Passover on the night of uh, the betrayal of Jesus. Now, he was the last uh, disciple of Jesus to have been uh, alive because the book of Revelation was written uh, uh, between 95 uh, to 100 AD. Some scholars would even say uh, AD 90. Fine, I don't, I don't have a problem about that. But definitely it's somewhere between AD 90 and AD 100. That was the time when John was sent to the Isle of Patmos by way of a punishment from the Roman Empire. Now John was the bishop of Ephesus at the time of his arrest and we know through history that he was at one point, uh, uh, he was immersed in a hot boiling uh, oil but he survived miraculously and the Romans didn't know what to do with him and he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, okay, from whence he writes uh, the book of Revelation. So how has the book of Revelation come to our hands? Let me read the verse again, the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay. Now, when it says the revelation of Jesus Christ, one shouldn't misconstrue that the book of Revelation is talking about the nature of Christ or it's talking about Christ. To a certain extent it is true, but the, the meaning, the revelation of Jesus Christ is the revelation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the revealer, spelt with a capital R, okay? The Apocalypse, okay. Which God gave unto him. The revelation of Jesus has been given to Jesus by God. Now we know that in the doctrine of Trinity, that the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are the same personality, one person, uh, one personality, but in three persons, God in three persons, triune God, Trinity, the word Trinity may not be there in the Bible, but the, the, the practicality of Trinity is there uh, in uh, the Bible. So I believe uh, in the doctrine of Trinity, I am a Trinitarian, and uh, the thing about Trinity is that we will never understand that. We should never try to understand that. We have to just leave it at that. But the Father and the Son are equal. So why would uh, it say here that this revelation which Jesus is giving uh, has been given to him by God to show that Jesus was inferior to the Father only in the incarnation. Okay, now the book of Revelation and the events therein have been made possible only because of the incarnation of Jesus. That we will see when we come to chapters 4 and 5 of Revelation. Okay, 
if Jesus did not come and die on the cross and if he did not rise again from the dead, then what happens in the book of Revelation would be very impossible. So, Jesus Christ who incarnated is the one who is eligible to reveal what, what is going to happen. So, in the context of that, here the Lord Jesus Christ is the incarnated Jesus Christ who is inferior to the Father. I believe you understand what I'm talking about. So that is why God had to give the revelation unto Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Now I'll read the verse again. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and uh, uh, signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Look at the progression of handing down the revelation. God hands it down to Jesus, the incarnated uh, Jesus. <coughs> Jesus hands it over to an angel and that angel hands it over to John. And John is handing it over to us. Beautiful, isn't it? The father to the son, the son to an angel, the angel to John, and John to us. It's beautifully brought down from heaven to us in a step-by-step -step manner, in a downward step-by-step -step manner. Beautiful, right? And what the contents, the contents is mentioned here. Now the giver is the father to the son, to the angel, to John, and to us, okay? The, the, the giver is the father. What is it? The revelation, the apocalypsis of Jesus, the incarnate son of God, okay? Now, what would the contents of this apocalypsis, the revelation, be? Once unveiled, what do you see? It says here, Things which must shortly come past. The word shortly in Greek is tacos. Not the tacos that you eat in Mexico. Right? This is tacos. Tacos means that things that must happen fast. Quickly. Right? Now... <clears throat> This fast and quickly can be interpreted in two ways. Number one, in the quickness of time. Okay. So this is AD, say let's, let's say it's AD 100. These things must happen within the next couple of years. That sort of quickness. But there is the other thing. When happening, they happen swiftly, quickly. They don't necessarily need to start immediately. They can start whenever. But when they start, they happen, pat, 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 quickly. Are you with me? So tacos mean that. Now many people understand tacos to mean Quickly in terms of time. Okay, this happened in AD 100. So, Jesus is showing John things that are going to happen soon. Although it's partially true, tacos doesn't have to mean that alone. Look, a lot of things from the book of Revelation have not commenced yet. But when they commence, they will happen rapidly. They will just happen fast, quick, one after the next, one after the next, after that, after that, after that, okay? That's tacos. Okay. Now, verse 2. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of the things that he saw? John. Who here is John? John is in an abstract way. Uh, submitting a, a qualification, a, 
a, a qualification of his own self. Three things. Who bear record of the word of God. He is a person who has studied the word of God. Because when he was with Jesus, he was a disciple, right? For three and a half years, he was a disciple of Jesus, a good one, by the way. He did not betray Jesus. He did not swear against Jesus like Peter did. He, he was not uh, uh, told off by Jesus. He was a nice guy. And he, he, he was a well-versed man in the scripture. That is perhaps why God chose him to write the fourth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John and the gospel of John written by this same John shows Jesus as the son of God. The divinity of Jesus is shown. And if you read the book of John, it is completely different to the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark and Luke. The gospel of John starts from the beginning. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And then within the 21 chapters that he writes, he is showing forth the divinity of Christ, the seven divine miracles Jesus performed, not any other miracle. And there are no parables mentioned in the Gospel of John. And within the 21 chapters, John is, is showing forth the Son of God, the, the Messiah incarnate, God incarnate. And he refers to a lot of Old Testament material. He was a man who knew his Torah, his Nebim, his Ketubim very well. A man of the word of God. So that's what he says, who bear record of the word of God. He knows that the word of God has always come to pass. He, he saw even he was with the word of God incarnate, namely Jesus. Look at the second qualification he has and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He has been with Jesus. He saw Jesus perform miracles. He saw Jesus die. He saw the empty grave. He saw Jesus after he rose again from the dead and he saw Jesus ascending to heaven from Mount Olive and uh, Jesus, he was at that time the best eyewitness to everything that Jesus had done when he came as a human being. So number one, he was the man of uh, the word of God. He bare record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Number three, of all things that he saw. He has seen in uh, a vision the things that are going to happen. My dear friends, <clears throat> We are living in a day and age where so many people are claiming to have seen a lot of things. Seen heaven, seen the paradise, seen the Hades, seen the hell, seen the future, blah, blah, blah. We must be very careful. Now, I don't believe if anybody comes and says that the person has gone to heaven and come back in a vision or whatever. Now, the Bible says that no one has ascended to the heaven except the, the sun. So God is there, angels are there, no man has gone to heaven. If, if, if we believe in a place where saints would rest, that is none other than paradise. There is a place called paradise which is not heaven. For Jesus told one of the two thieves on the cross who uh, acknowledged Jesus to be the Lord, Jesus said, today you shall be in, with me in paradise. So there is the place called paradise. Now it's not just a place in parables, it is a real place. Now I believe that during the rapture of the church of which we will talk later in our series, by the time we reach chapter 4, verse 1, we will talk about the rapture. When the rapture happens, the previously dead people in the Lord who are resting in paradise will come to life and will go to heaven for the first time. Nobody has ever been to heaven. Now, those who claim to have gone to paradise, Mm, I'm a little bit precarious about those things, right? Okay, I don't disvouch it completely. Maybe they, some people might have gone and seen the paradise, fine. Uh, but I'm really 
uh, scared of those people who claim to have gone and seen Hades. Now, when, when people say that they went to Hades, they see demons ruling the place. Demons afflicting pain on people, etc., uh, etc. Et but for me, when I read the Bible, Hades and hell were places created for the demons to go and be afflicted. They, they have to suffer there. If they are going to rule, then they, that's not suffering for them. So I see in these people's visions, you know, I have read books of these people who have gone, apparently gone to Hades and come back. And I have heard people say, you know, they dramatize so beautifully. They say how the demons were using uh, spears to attack people. They were inflicting pain after pain to people, etc. Now that shows that those demons are having a gala time in, in Hades. God never created the Hades for the demons to have a gala time. No, 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 no. If the, the Hades has been created, which is true, the Bible says, some demons are in chains even in Hades right now. There are the demons which are roaming and eventually they'll end up in Hades. And the final place for Satan and his stooges would be the hellfire. Gehina, the, the final uh, lake of fire, hell. So Satan, no, his demons, all these will suffer in Hades and hell. They don't go and rule there. And uh, we have to be very careful of those people who come and say that they went to Hades, etc., etc. Some people say, I went to uh, paradise in a vision. I went to heaven in a vision. And I saw David, I saw Elijah, I saw Moses. Be careful. But here is a person who says that uh, he has actually seen the future and uh, he has written that in the Bible. Now that's John. So my dear friends, there is no doubt in reading the book of Revelation to understand what John saw. The only verified truth of a person who has seen anything of the future, anything of heaven, anything of paradise is John. And praise God, his revelation has been inscribed in the Bible to us so we can trust John's revelation. Are you with me? So here is his qualification in threefold, three parts. A man who is well versed with the word of God. A man who has been with Jesus and seen Jesus and who could bear witness uh, to Jesus and who has seen what is going to happen in the future. Verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. Here we see that the end times are near. But then again, my dear friends, this was written about 2000 years ago. And now we know that, you know, if we ask God, why Lord, you said things are going to happen soon, but it's not happening. He would say, for me, one day is like thousand years. <laughs> what can we do about that? So nonetheless, we know the time is near. Now, if in AD 100, John says the time is near, we are living in 2015. And how much more near should we be to the end, time, end times? I believe, I believe we are very much close to the end times, my dear friends. Okay, but I must uh, be very careful in trying to explain uh, the book of Revelation because uh, there are different ways of understanding the book of Revelation. Let me, let me tell you the, the four main, the four main uh, ways of uh, interpreting the book of Revelation. The first one I would say is, was started by a man called Oregon, one of our old church fathers who lived uh, in the third century AD, Oregon, the church father. I would say he lived uh, around 250, 260, 270 AD. He initiated something. Up until then, up until then, the book of Revelation, for, for about 150 years, the book of Revelation was understood literally. Until Oregon came and introduced a view called the idealist view of the book of Revelation. 
The idealist view is to metaphorize the book of Revelation. So Oregon thought that the book of Revelation contains metaphors and allegory. So it's the allegorical form of interpretation. Now Oregon's teaching was taken well on board by a great scholar that we have in church history. He, he was Augustine of Hippo from 354 AD onwards. He began to uh, make uh, the allegorical view or the idealist view uh, very prominent because he was a great theologian. Boy, I'll tell you, one of the greatest, theo greatest theologians in church history, history has been Augustine of Hippo and uh, he vouched for the idealist view. Now this view holds that everything you see in the book of Revelation are allegories, metaphors. So you need to unravel the spiritual meaning behind everything. So the book of Revelation for them is just a book of spiritualities, spiritual allegories, metaphors, symbols, etc, etc. So there is nothing literal. Now I don't agree with that because when I see the book of Revelation, I see a lot of literal stuff uh, in there. Now I'll tell you eventually what I believe. So that's number one, okay, idealistic view. Then there is another view called the Preterist view. Preter, Preter, Preter in Latin means past. So the Preterist view of interpreting the book of Revelation holds that everything mentioned in the book of Revelation were things that transpired in the past for John because John is writing around 100 AD and these things happened a few years before that. So all the destruction, uh, the destruction part of what Revelation talks about happened when Titus, the son of Vespasian, the emperor of Rome, in, who invaded uh, Jerusalem with, with his troops in AD 70 and massacred the Jews and destroyed the temple, this destroyed Jerusalem, lit fire to the temple and to Jerusalem. And those are the things that we see in the book of Revelation. Now, I have a problem about understand, about accepting the preterist view because in verse 1 we say we see that uh, this book contains things which must shortly come to pass so if things are shortly to come to pass in AD 100 those things must be after AD 100 but the preterists say that it happened in the past now, the third group of pre people are the historicists. The historical view of the book of Revelation is quite interesting. I accept part of their uh, theory, not the whole of it though. Now, they divide the book of Revelation into segments to connote the time from the inception of the church or from AD 100, whatever, all the way to the end of ages. So everything is historically divided. So for example, the first three chapters would uh, talk about the time from the church, the church era, okay. And then from chapter 4 to chapter 7 would be talking about the demise of the Roman Empire. And then eventually what transpires in the world in the future. So when I teach the book of Revelation, you would, be, you would see that I take on board the part of what, what they teach, these historicists, historicists teach, but not the whole of it. Now, the final and the fourth, the futuristic uh, view. Now, I subscribe to that, uh, that teaching, okay? Where, now, now, Okay, the term suggests that it's futuristic, so everything in the book of Revelation must happen in the future. Yes, that's true, but, uh, oh, but our belief is not just futuristic, just because we talk about uh, the things that are going to happen in the future uh, are mentioned in the, in the Bible. Uh, we don't dismiss 
the symbolism present in revelation the allegories the metaphors and the literal meanings now we don't dismiss these things and look we take on board the historical elements literal elements the symbols the allegories the metaphors we we take on board all those and this is what say the futurists believe this and i am an ardent believer of what i'm saying the first three chapters deal with the church age from the starting of the church all the way to the rapture of the church okay and from chapter 4 to 22 are things that are going to happen on earth and in heaven from the time the church is raptured okay now we know that uh, so many theories are there theories are abounding there is this millennial crisis a uh, millennium the thousand year reign some people would say they are uh, when when we talk about the millennium i will explain in more detail but some people would say there is no millennium a millennialists some people say we are pre millennialists and some people would say we are post millennialists and then talking about the tribulation some people would say we are pre tribulational um, dispensationalists and some would say we are mid tribulational pre millennial uh, dispensationalists you know all these technological terminologies don't worry about them right now when we talk about the millennium in future we will talk uh, uh, about these uh, different uh, teachings but right now i would like to say that uh, the book of revelation talks about things during the time of john all the way up to the time of rapture in the first 3 chapters of the book and then from 4 to 22 talks of talk about the future after the rapture of the church things that are going to happen on earth and in heaven and finally the new heavens and the new earth so that is why john is saying the time is at hand these things are going to happen soon but he says blessed is he that uh, readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein now three kinds of blessings are there blessing blessing means uh, makarios meaning joy happy right so uh, b- b- blessing blessed happy is the person he is really going to be blessed and we know about blessing i have other teachings where i have taught about blessings i don't have time here to 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 uh, talk about blessing but it says blessed are those who read it number one why Let me tell you something like this if you are planning to go on a very beautiful cruise trip okay you are planning a cruise trip well in a cruise liner you are going to negotiate the scandinavian waters you are going to sail through norway the barents sea and uh, what not uh, above holland and you know this beautiful or the caribbean okay a nice uh, cruise holiday cruise and uh, you get a itinerary day 1 you are going there day 2 you are going there hey you know what shall i tell you the example that i used in my church many people love to go to israel now i go to israel several times a year and uh, many people uh, come with me and uh, for some people going to israel is a dream it's a dream right uh, once in a lifetime thing so Uh, imagine somebody has now gotten ready to go so next month they are going to israel and they get the itinerary so when they go through the itinerary they are so excited okay day 1 we are going to land in tel aviv and we are going to go to jaffa and eat those jaffa or oranges and then have lunch somewhere there and we stay by uh, the 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 ocean of tel aviv in a beautiful uh, five star hotel and then the next day we are going to travel day 2 uh, leave tel aviv and travel through sesaria pass 
crossing Netanya and then to Haifa and uh, ascend Mount Carmel, go on the other side of Mount Carmel to see Muharqa where the fire descended uh, in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 38. And um, wow, and then day three, go through Megiddo, visit uh, uh, Ahab's uh, fortress there. And then, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually go to Tiberias where they stay uh, in a beautiful uh, uh, resort by the Sea of Galilee. All these things. Won't, won't you be so excited to look at it over and over and over again? Wow, I'm going to do that. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be in Jerusalem. I'm going to walk along those paths. I'm going to negotiate the Via Dolorosa, blah, blah, blah. Wouldn't you be so happy? excited if that's the first time you're going to go right if that's the first time you are and perhaps the only time you're going to go and the more you read the the, the itinerary you'll be thrilled right now if somebody comes to your house and that somebody looks at that little paper and they take oh, what is this and you are saying I'm going to Israel next month and this is the itinerary wow okay and this, if that person starts to read that itinerary, oh, day one, da 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 da, day two, da 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 da, wouldn't you be happy to hear them read what you are going to do next month in Israel? Obviously, yes. That's how God is happy when you read the book of Revelation. Now, the person who is coming and reading that little leaflet may not know anything about Israel, but when they read, you are so happy because you are going to be in that. And if you read the book of Revelation, perhaps you may not understand anything. But when you read it, God hears it. And when he hears it, he is excited. Why? Because he is looking forward to take the church in a rapture. He is looking forward to do all the things that the book of Revelation says that God is going to do in the future. He is waiting patiently but impatiently. He is waiting for the time when it is ready to rapture the church and start the things that are there in the book of Revelation from chapter 4 onwards. He is so excited and he knows what's going to happen. He knows how these are going to happen. He is all the more excited and the more you read about these things, boy, I'll tell you, God is going to be happy. You are going to make God happy. So my dear friends, from today, start reading the book of Revelation. It doesn't matter if you don't understand it. Just read for the Lord hears it and he gets a thrill of what's going to happen in the future. Okay? Now, also, if somebody has been mocking you, okay? Now, let's say that you were saying to somebody, one day I would like to go to Israel. And that somebody said, oh no, you will never make it. It's a, uh, it involves a lot of money. It involves a lot of courage. It involves a lot of this and that. You won't make it. Now, you are very upset. You are very upset that this person is mocking you. Now, finally, you are going to go to Israel next month. And you have that little leaflet there. And that person who mocked you comes to your house. And that person looks at this little program. And then the person reads it. Or you read it or somebody else read it, reads it. And when that person hears it, that person gets very upset because that person told you that you will never ever make it. Okay? And uh, when, when, when it is red, when it, when it is in black and white that you are going to really make it and you know that that person is hearing this, you will be very happy. You will be very happy. In your heart you will say, mm -hmm, you were mocking me. Uh -huh -huh -huh. Now I am going at last, right? On the same token, when we read, the Satan also listens. He also hears it. And when he hears it, he gets upset because it reminds him of his doom. The, 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 the complete, the verified, the, the doom of Satan when you read. And he gets upset. And when the devil gets upset, God is happy. So my dear friends, blessed is he that readeth and the one who heareth it. So if you have a way in which you can download the reading of the book of Revelation, play it in your house. 
Play it in your car just like the way you play your songs. Play it on your iPods and listen to it. It doesn't matter if you don't really understand, right? You just listen to it because even those who listen are blessed. And then there are things, certain things that we can do. And if there are things that we can do and if we do those things, right, and keep those things which are written therein, they are also blessed. Now, my dear friends, this verse has a deutero fulfillment, dual fulfill, fulfillment. This verse immediately pertains to the book of Revelation. But secondarily, it also pertains to the entire Bible. Okay? Initially, it's for the book of Revelation. But if you ask me, would we be blessed only if we read the book of Revelation? No, 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 no. It applies secondarily to the entire Bible. So my dear friends, you read the whole Bible, you will be blessed. You listen the reading of the Bible, you'll be blessed. And you obey the scriptures and do and keep the things therein, you'll be blessed. So this third verse applies both to the revelation in an exclusive manner and also to the entire Bible in a very profound manner. So my dear friends, today in our first lesson, we have uh, sort of done our introduction and we have gone and meditated three verses and we saw how uh, beautiful the book of Revelation is going to be, how the book of Revelation has been handed down to us. And uh, I believe if you want to read it, uh, listen to this again, you can play it again, you can download it and if you want the DVDs, we can send them, you contact us, our details are there on the screen for you and uh, come and join me the next time when I start expounding verse 4 of Revelation 1 onwards and may the revealer Jesus Christ himself continue to bless you as you ponder and study the book of Revelation. God bless you. Take care. Bye.